does it sound okay? I mean, I don't know what to do here. So, we're giving it a shot. All right. Hi, and welcome back to our YouTube channel for Inside Out Therapeutics. Um, as I promised last time, we're going to have a special guest, and look, here she Yay. is. Um, everybody, this is my sister, Charlene McLaughlin. Hi. Charlene is a elementary school teacher with over 20 years of experience in teaching fourth, fifth third, grades? Fourth, fifth. third fourth, fifth grades. Um, plus, she's a pretty awesome mom to two of my nephews. So, yes. you're welcome. Um, she's also kind of, and this is going to sound really weird, but <laughs> we're six years apart. She's older. Um, and, <laughs> you're welcome. And we're really, really, really eerily similar. Um, we think pretty much the same way, and so... Like twins. Yeah. Uh, fraternal, not identical, because I'm no. much better looking. What well, uh, about hair? <laughs> there's that. <laughs> so, I couldn't think of anybody better to, to do this presentation with and this video with. Um, because this is this is a passion that both of us share. Uh, she comes at it from a little bit of a different perspective than I do, having had the education, the educational background, to to see these kids growing up and see um, what they're like in their early lives. Um, and so today, really, again, we're covering we're, we're covering the the hard topic, um, suicide prevention. We first did a presentation like this at Madras, Madras Middle mm -hmm. School um, for the parents and teachers there, um, and it was really, really well received, and we got a lot of good feedback from it, and they wanted us to go ahead and put the, the video of our presentation online, and unfortunately that video, the audio in that was, was not salvageable. And so we're going to kind of do a little bit of a rehash for that. Um, what we're going to do instead is without the PowerPoint presentation, um, which I don't think you're really going to miss anything because yeah. realistically we're the show here, not the, <laughs> not the PowerPoints. Um, you'll see that we're both wearing the suicide awareness ribbon, teal and purple. Um, again, it is something that is near and dear to my heart, and I know that absolutely that you you share you share in it as well. Um, it's fortunately not hit too close to home for us, but I don't even think that it's fair to say that we're more than six degrees of separation away from from people we know who've mm -hmm. who've been touched by the tragedy that is that is suicide, and uh, even more so the tragedy that is youth suicide. Um, so today we're gonna we're we're gonna really tackle this and really give some some background and some feedback and some direction really in in how to go about having these conversations with your kids because the important part is to remember you know my hashtag from last time and again the corrected version talking about it won't make it happen. Um, it's really, really important to have these conversations. But let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about you know the statistics. Well, any one is too many. True. So forty six hundred teens a year. It's a lot. It is suicide, or at least attempt suicide, um, according to the CDC. It's the second leading cause of death between ten from ten to twenty four year olds. 10 to 24 year olds yeah. who are taking their own lives because they just don't see any other out. They don't see any other way. So remind me. So your your kids are how old? My in kids fourth are grade? fourth graders are 10 and 11 years old. So these are these They're are babies. elementary school kids. They're babies. What do you what do you see in in these kids? I mean, developmentally, what do what do you see as far as what what are they doing? What just are, kids you know, this age? Yeah, yeah, 10 year olds. Oh gosh, some of them still play with their their little puppets and stuffed animals. They they bring little Pokemon to school. I mean, they're they're it's we try to act as if they're so mature and so grown up and then my colleagues and I have to remind ourselves every day how young they really they're are. They're still kids. They're, they're still kids. they're living their childhood. They play tag. They they <laughs> cheat at hide and seek. They I mean they, they sneak candy in their lunches when their moms aren't looking. They they are kids. They're babies. And to see the angst and anxiety 
to see them feel like they've got no one to talk to or no friends to play with or no adults backing them up. It, it's horrible to see hopelessness in a kid that young. And and realistically, you know, when we when we look at how we define the problem of depression to the point of suicide, what we're looking at is we're we're looking at that at that stress. You know, whether it comes from the family, whether it comes from the school, we're looking at anxiety. And anxiety can take tons of different forms. Do you do you see anxiety in your oh, kids? Absolutely. So where what how does absolutely. it manifest? Just just for a normal everyday no, it, normal it, everyday yeah. kid. It could be a couple of different ways. Um, um, they could either withdraw and not want to hang out with any of their friends or talk to any of their peers. Um, it could manifest as crying, which we don't usually see in a 10 or 11 year old. Um, sometimes they just get frazzled like we do as adults, but then also don't know how to cope with that. Um, just it depends on the kid. It depends on, on what they've seen from adults that they've been around. And I, And realistically, that's what we see in the office as well. Um, anxiety manifests in tons of different ways across across the spectrum. You know, and I right now my my youngest client is four years old. My oldest client is much much older than that. You're welcome if you're watching this. <laughs> um, and anxiety can can really show in just the the ways in which we would expect you know that that kind of nervous feeling that jittery feeling angst. restless feeling yeah the angst um, sometimes it's anger especially with my teenagers we with with my kids who don't know how to manage the anxiety we just get mad we get mad we can't get rid of it we can't explain it sometimes and I'm sure that your your kids are kind of the same way they don't have words to to describe what it is so I'm just gonna act out because I understand anger and you understand anger and if I'm angry you're paying attention to me and hopefully you can figure it out because I can't because I can't tell you what it is because I don't know what it is they they can't express their emotions yeah they don't they don't know how to put that there's no vocabulary for right, it right um, and we'll talk about you know we'll we'll talk about more on on how to how to give them that vocabulary later in the later in the video um, what you may also see is that that hopelessness that Charlene was talking about, that just feeling as as though nothing matters, who cares? I won't ever be able to fix this, so why bother? I'm never gonna pass. I'm never gonna pass the test. I'm not gonna get this right. I'm so stupid. That sort of stuff. I can't. I just can't do it. Yeah. Um, the helplessness, you know, and. Nobody, nobody can help me, so I'm just not going to bother telling anybody. I don't want to bother anybody. I don't want to. Uh, I, I don't. I don't want anybody to worry about me. I had a client come in today, and it was exactly that. I, I don't want people to worry about me. I got this. I can. I can do this. Um, don't let me ever end my YouTube channel, you know, for forever and ever and ever without telling you my my theory on the I I got this. Um, it, it's a it, it's a roadblock, but we'll get to that in a much much later video. Um, my teenagers, and I don't I don't know how it is for for your kids, for your for the younger kids necessarily at school, um, but. What my parents will tell me is that my teenagers especially will isolate. They'll withdraw. Mm -hmm. um, they'll kind of start pushing away their friends. Um, when it comes to suicide, what they're doing here is they're saying goodbye. You know, I, I want to push you away because if I push you far enough away, then you won't hurt when I'm gone. Um, if I'm acting out and I'm making you really, really mad at me, you're not going to miss me, and I'm okay with that because I would rather spare your feelings. Because then you'll be mad at me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I won't. You won't want me around anyway. Right, and and then it's then it's becoming you know kind of a self fulfilling prophecy. The other thing we see is um, that loneliness, and it, it's really weird for me to talk about loneliness and teenagers and and you know young adults and well even kids when we're talking about the age of social media how can you be lonely when you have snapchat and you have kick and you have you know whatsapp and you have because, insta and finsta and everything even else though they're on them 23 and a half hours a day they know it's not substantial they know it's not a legitimate relationship they may tell you that it is they may mm -hmm. tell you that these people are their friends they may tell you that they're hanging out with them just because they're 
texting them or snapchatting and snapping with them um but they know they know it's not a, a significant relationship yeah and and the parents know too i mean you guys know because you'll you'll come into my office and you'll say hey wait a second these these are friends that they they don't even know they can't go out and touch them and feel them and play with them and but they're their hang best out with friends. them but, but they swear that these are their best friends and I'm afraid to take that away from them because that's the only social outlet they have. And that becomes a problem, too. But we're going to cover that one in a whole different section, too. Well, a whole different video, actually, when we talk a little bit more about parenting and how to how to be a parent in the 21st century when your kids have their smartphones literally attached to their to their hands uh, 23 and a half hours a day. Right. And probably that other half, too. But you yeah, probably just don't notice it. Yeah, they're in the... Well, I was going to say they're in the shower, but... They take them in the shower. Yeah, they take them in the shower, too, sometimes. Um, So how do we get to understand the risk factors? You know, where do they come from? What what are we looking for to to make sure that we know, that we're educated as parents, as clinicians, as teachers? What what are we looking for? We're, We're looking for one of the questions, actually, one of the questions that I ask the very first session anybody steps in is, is there any history of diagnosed mental illness on either mom's side of the family or dad's side of the family? This is a really, really important um, question because it gets to the genetic aspect of a lot of mental illnesses. Some mental illnesses don't have a genetic aspect. Um, But then there are some that we we really are, are coming to understand have that much broader impact bipolar disorder which is which is both mania and depression um to some degree is genetic or at least we need to know that it exists in the family because then we kind of know what we're looking for Mm -hmm. um you know depression in general well you know i hear a lot well you know my grandmother had it, but it wasn't really diagnosed. But you know, she was just she was just really um, a hermit, or she was she was really a shut in, or something like that. And nobody ever really diagnosed it. But we feel like that's probably it, and and that's important for us to know too. Um, anytime that there's that there's depression. Um, I don't know if you remember, but Dad had depression. You know, there were there were those times when you know there was. I would go to I would go to school and come home from school and find him in exactly the same place in his just bathroom. In his bathroom, coffee cup coffee cup in front of him, um, probably having gone through the coffee pot of coffee easily or two, or two and about seven hundred pages further in his book because for him that depression started there. That depression started when he felt that that hopelessness and helplessness, and the only thing that he could muster to do during the day was. To engross him, engross himself into a book and, and escape. And escape. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Not think about any of his problems, not try to solve anything, not try to fix anything, just not deal with it. Yeah. And that escape is what a lot of our kids are looking for. Um, they Video turn, games. They, I was about to say, they, they turn to a lot of different things. Video games especially. Um and now you're finding the dab pens, you know, the those those wonderful things that contain THC that they tell you they're just vaping and vaping is vaping is an issue too. The amount of nicotine that these kids are, are ingesting. And this is this is kids younger than younger than ten years old are mm-hmm. trying it, you know. Um all the way up through you know, through high schools. Because um, it smells good. Because it smells good. Yeah, and then there was a story the other day that I that I read that um, one of the local teenagers had gotten charged for having for having THC um, for having a dab pen in his in his possession. Um, it's a it's absolutely a, a crime because it's possession of a, of a uh, narcotic. I guess I don't I don't know specifically, but it's possession of drugs, um, and so there's there's that aspect of it too. Um, we don't just look at the the mental illness aspect of things, though. We look at no, a lot of you, other things. You have to look at the whole <laughs> child, the whole person. Um, how are they? Has their behavior changed? Mm. Um, are they acting their age? Are they reverting back to younger days or acting too mature? Um, how are they treating their friends? How are they treating their parents and their their siblings? Um, just. <clears throat> You have to be aware. You've got to know your kid. And that, to me, 
knowing your child yeah. and being yep. able to talk to them um, are, are the two biggest things that you could do to, to be aware, to, to see what's going on with them and, and to see some of the signs if they're in trouble. We've, I know you and I have talked several times about you know what, what our kids hear and what our kids don't hear. Um, if you think that there's, that, that there's a place where you can talk in private and your kids are <laughs> at least in the same building, chances are you can't. Um, my sister and I were fortunate enough when we were growing up to, to be taught by our aunt and uncle and our cousins a a second language um <laughs> that was that was it's called g um <clears throat> but we we were very very proficient in it and so when both of us had had younger kids we would we would use that so that we can talk about things that were adult like and that they didn't need to know <laughs> unfortunately they learned it way too quickly <laughs> um when her when her oldest son learned it, we actually switched to Pig Latin and G. Um, that was just way too time consuming, and we just you know realize, let him realize that we were talking about him. But you know, then we just did it via text. So thanks for whoever came up with that with, with that in, uh, invention. Um, but if you if there's dysfunction in the family, if you think you're hiding it from your kids, chances are you're not. They're they're listening. To almost everything you say, even if they're sitting there engrossed in their video games, or their phones. Trust me when I say that the that the whisper you think you're whispering, if it's if it's something juicy, you're if listening. it's, I'm sorry, let me let me rephrase that. If it's tea, they're gonna hear it because then you know they like it. And if you don't understand that phrase, please by all means go ask any of your children or look it up on Urban Dictionary. I have to look that one up. Uh, tea? That's just gossip. Okay. Yeah, it's just gossip. Sorry, I gave you the answer. But, e- but even if you, <coughs> even if you don't say it, even if they don't overhear it, they'll feel it. They they know. Yeah. They they're not oblivious. They know when there's tension. They know when there, when there are things going on in the home that are out of their control, and that's what's going to get cause them anxiety. Yeah. Things that they feel like they can't are affecting them, but they have no control over them. There are there are you know in in that same sort of uh, vein, there are environmental factors that we have to worry about when it comes to suicides too. Are there are, are is there domestic violence in the house? What are what is it that the kids are seeing from a physical standpoint, um, not just a verbal standpoint, but but a physical standpoint too? Are they are they learning how to how to use violence to solve a problem? Um, and are there firearms in the house? That's that is a huge 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 predictor of environmental risk when it comes to use suicide or, or suicide in general um, please don't please don't mistake me saying that for you know advocating for the repeal of the second amendment or anything else we're not getting political here um, but it is it is a risk factor if there is a means in the home and somebody is intent on doing it they, they will figure out how to use the means um, and they might have some responses to traumatic situations there are kids who you know who've lost a pet who've lost a friend, um, grandparent. a grandparent, yeah, or parents through divorce, um, parents through illness. Maybe they've been ill. Um, you know, you know, a lot of you know that um, that our great niece Kenny, you know, had developed cancer. That that would be traumatic for trust me when I say everybody in the family, and we're a pretty big family. Mm-hmm. But I think that that rippled everybody's everybody's world um, to a great degree. So all of these traumatic events kind of pile up. And again, a lot of our kids who who we're talking about who are susceptible to to suicidal thoughts and tendencies and attempts. A lot of them really just don't have the means by which to deal with it, and so they kind of shut down. And that's and that's something escape. right, and and that's something that we really need to look for. Um, threats of suicide. If if somebody in your life threatens their own life that they're going to commit suicide. I, there is never a time when you take that lightly. I, I have people call me probably every day of the week and say, I don't know what to do. My kid, my sister, my family member, whoever, my friend, they said that they were going to kill themselves. And my answer is always the same. We need to find them some help. We've always, in our social media posts, 
put up all of the pertinent information for suicide hotlines. Um, GCAL again, I mentioned on my on our last video. Um, GCAL even has a even has an app that you can use. There are so many outlets, and there are men 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. If somebody says to you, "I'm I'm thinking about this," it, it it's not for you to help to to help other than to say, "Let's go get you somebody who can help." And that's that's good to know because I think that we would want to try to help ourselves right. and and do what we could do when it, by that point it would already be bigger than bigger than us. Right. Um, if you're if someone you know is planning for suicide, if they are giving away their prized possessions, um, making a will or writing a suicide note, those are telltale signs. Those are never th those are red flags that absolutely cannot be cannot be ignored. Um, like we talked about earlier, if they have the means to commit suicide, if the firearms are in the home, if you know the the Bowie knives are, are in their room under their beds, you know. Things like that. These are these are pretty serious signs. Um, if your kid is not necessarily in the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts and doesn't need his his or her merit badge for tying knots, and all of a sudden they're asking for rope, um, and they've had depression, it, I hope that it triggers a little yeah. bit of a light a light bulb. Again, yeah. you've got to know your kids. You've, you've got to talk yeah. to them. You you've got to know what they're doing. Um, there's a there's a word I love and it's called anhedonia. Anhedonia is the is the opposite of hedonism, um, finding joy in everything. Anhedonia is finding joy in nothing. If all of a sudden they don't want to go and hang out with their friends or they're no longer playing video games and you're just kind of like, nah, I don't really feel like it. I'm kind of tired. I'm going to go to bed. Um, if they're if they no longer want to be a professional soccer player when they grow up and they're no longer outside in the backyard practicing and they've been practicing for hours and hours and hours up until then you know again like you said you got to know your kid you got to know what it is that they're that they're wanting to do willing to do usually doing and if and if that changes in a, in a drastic way it, something's it, up something's up it doesn't necessarily have to be suicide don't don't get me wrong i'm not saying that all but of these but something's bothered but something yeah something's up and so there has to be there there has to be um, a discussion uh, a, a way in which that we can go ahead and get the ball rolling in in what's going on with our kids um and I know that you know, when we when we did the presentation, you were you were talking about some stuff with with your son. Um, our, our favorite place to talk is in the car. Um, it, it's just a a natural controlled environment. That no, can't escape. There's no distractions. Mm -hmm. They can't escape. <laughs> Even if they're staring out the window or staring at the phone, they've got to hear me. Um, and I've got to hear them. Um, we're both captive audiences. So anytime we're in the car together, I start some kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. Even if everything's going great, it doesn't have to just be, you know, to find out what's wrong with them. But that's, that's the best time to talk for us. Um, sitting at the dinner table, sitting in, in the living room after dinner, just turn the TV off. Hold on one second, because because you bring up a really good topic, and we've talked about the importance of family meals. Dinner. Oh, oh my goodness! Gosh. Like I can't tell you the importance of family dinners, and, and and you know what? I can hear some of you now, and you're saying to me, "Yeah, but you know what? We have soccer practice, and we have baseball practice, and one kid has to go here, and I've got to get this one to dance, and I've got to." Okay, so if you can't do if you can't do dinner, do breakfast. I mean. Have breakfast as a family. Sit if, down and have dessert together yeah, after, when everybody's something. just before bed. Something. A place where a place where you can sit down as a family and just kind of go. Attendance is what's expected. going on. Yeah. You got to be here. Yep. There's no there. There's no video games. No there's cell no phones. cell phones. It, For the parents too. Yeah. I mean, and and let's face it. I mean, how long does it take you guys to eat dinner? 15 minutes. Yeah, easily. So we're asking 15, 20 minutes of your time, which I promise you this goes such a long way. I had a kid tell me the other day, you know, I don't, I don't notice that my dad notices me unless he's buying me something. And that just broke my heart. And I was like, well, yeah, tell me a little bit more about that. And he's like, well... I just don't even think he notices that I'm there. But when he's when he's given me something, I at least know that I I, I exist in his world. And 
And that was just, it was really, really hard to hear. It was really hard to hear. Yeah. Um, because it's unnecessary. I mean, like, like you know, I, I don't know how long it takes you guys to eat dinner. I mean, it for us, it's long. like, you know, okay, I'm, I'm going to admit I usually have seconds, so it takes me maybe 20 minutes. Um, plus, I really like to cook, and my, co- my food's pretty good. So <laughs> His food is pretty good. <laughs> um, but, you know, one of the other things we do, and I don't do it every <clears throat> night, and I do it a lot less since my boys are older, but at night, when they're just before they go to sleep, I just go sit on the side of their bed and say, "All right, tell me one good thing that happened there today, one great thing and one horrible thing, one good thing and one thing you wish you could change." And even that, it takes two or three minutes. Yep. Sometimes it starts a longer discussion because they want to talk, and once they start talking, I don't stop them; <laughs> I let them keep going. Um, and sometimes it's just a, a short little thing. And can I just tell you about it tomorrow? I'm so tired. But but they know that I'm listening. But you've got to hold them to that too. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's that 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 dam right, has so been tell, breached. So, so tell me, tell yeah. me what you were going to tell me last night. Um, but you've got to find the time. We're all busy. It's, we're all busy. It, life is crazy. Um, but you've got to find the three or four minutes to just let your kid know that they are your world. They have your undivided attention for that tiny moment of time and this is also a time when you're not going to yell you're not going to scream you're just going to listen um you know there's there's a a lot of um a, a lot of data to suggest that when we're listening to someone really actively actively listening to them um not just not just hearing the words that they're saying and playing on our phones no actually engaging with them paraphrasing back what they're saying to you you know all of those all of those great active listening skills they teach you and all the management meanings and you know for me it was leadership meanings. yeah tons of grad school classes and blah 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 um all of those things that we can do to show them that they are, like Charlene said, our world in that moment. We don't. We, we can reserve time later to yell at them because they just disclosed to us something that, you know, outside of our poker face, we're kind of like, <laughs> but, you know, in front of our kids, we're like, okay, yeah, well, tell me a little Keep bit going. more just about that. Keep yeah. talking. Okay. So, yeah, that must have been hard for you. Those those sorts of cues, let them know that you're talking. And, you know, don't be disingenuous. Don't just do it because I'm telling you to do it, but actually listen to what they're saying. Our kids are pretty awesome. I mean, really. Mm-hmm. Our kids are awesome. They come in and they sit in my in my in, in my room, in my therapy room, and I, I really hope that that for the parents whose kids come to see me, I really hope you guys get to see like half of the personality that I get to see. Oh, and us and in I, the classrooms. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and and it really needs to be that way for, for you guys at home, too. It's so important to, like we've said, like, what, five times now, you have to know your kid, and the only way you're going to be able to do that spend is to spend them. time with them. And and spend time without it being something like, oh, well, I have to drive you to soccer practice, or oh, I'm coming to pick you up from detention, or, you know, no, it has to be more than just that. Hey, you know what? We're going to go, and we're going to spend some time together. You know, we... You guys know I work crazy amounts of hours. I'm working all the time. But Sunday nights are our family dinner nights. My kids are older, you know. They've they're leading their own lives, and we don't get the chance to have it every night. And you know, but there's at least one day a week when you know there's no phones at the table. We're we're enjoying each other's company. We're talking about how the week was going. Well, and they all look forward to it too. They do. It's it's they do. You know, it may seem like it's a mandatory thing, but all of you guys do yeah. it just because you want to. Yeah, even even if I'm working Sunday night or Sunday during the day, I'll get the inevitable text message. Hey, what's for dinner tonight? Are we doing family night? Yeah, are we doing, are we doing game night tonight? <laughs> and and we do. You know, we, we do game night, too, because why not? Because it's mean, one night a week yeah. that you're devoting to your family. And. And you don't get a second chance at this. Your kids aren't going to be 10, 11, 12, 14 years old forever. You, you get one chance. And once they grow up, trust me, my oldest is 32, trust me, you miss being able to have those, to have those chats. The, the, con, the context changes, the, the, the tempo changes, everything changes. And you really want to go back to those days when you can just kind of sit down and say, well. What's going on? Yeah. And and so you really have to have those talks. Really, they're they're so important. Um, 
Mm-hmm. You can also do family meetings. You ever, you guys ever do family meetings? Um, I haven't done family meetings. We do class meetings. Okay. In, at work in the classrooms, but we, we haven't done. What are your meetings. What are your class meetings like? Um, they're kid led. The okay. kids are the ones who are in charge of talking about what they want to talk about, what they feel is important, what they feel is an issue in the classroom or in our grade level or in our school. Um, and it, it, it's just a chance for us to give them a voice. Do they get to vent? Um, not so much there. Okay. Just because, you know, you get 23 kids all mm-hmm. venting at the same Fair time. Enough. It gets a little out of control. Fair enough. Um, but I could see where you could do that in a family yeah, setting. Yeah, absolutely. When absolutely. there's only, you know, three kids or hey, even or, Even that, I think that even that gets a little bit harder but you know maybe maybe like what you were talking about earlier so tell me tell me the good stuff tell me the bad stuff um or if there's something topical in the in the news and unfortunately and and any of you who follow me on facebook kind of kind of know or rather follow the uh the company on facebook um you kind of know that that i i really have this crusade against the the youth suicides that are going on in our schools and especially here in fayette county um anytime and and again it's it's unfortunate that i can say that anytime these happen but unfortunately, that's that's the rea- that's our reality. Un- unfortunately, any time that these happen, there is a perfect opportunity for you to for you to talk about it with your with your kids. Um, these are their friends. These are these are their peers. Their peers, yeah. These are these are those there by the grace of God go I sort of moments for them. This is this is as real as death gets for them. And when I know when you and I were growing up. We were invincible. There was there was no no thought of our impending doom. You know, that that didn't it that didn't happen. We weren't we, we weren't faced with it every day. Right. And if anybody told you about it, they were wrong. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, we no, we we can go ahead and we could jump off a two story building and you know what? We'll get up and we'll dust ourselves off and limp back home and you know, mom will put some peroxide on it and everything will be good. You know, no big deal. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's fixable, but when you're that age, right? But not at, not so anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean, death is death is all. I mean, Sandy Hook, you know, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. I, these kids are. This is what they're faced with. Death is no longer, and I think I said this in my last video. Death is no longer an obscure thought for it's them. It's not abstract. This is this is real. This is this is as real as it gets. And when kids when kids understand, or when they came to understand that they're no longer as invulnerable as they as they were, or safe, or safe, it. It rocked their world, and we, and that's when I think we started really seeing an uptick in in youth suicides. You know, back 1991, it was, there was Columbine. That that was kind of what what started off the whole the whole movement of not feeling safe in your schools anymore. Um, and it's only gotten worse. And I know that the um, the code red drills Oof. are important. I know they're important, but those in themselves are so scary. Because it makes it real for them. We're practicing what would happen if. Right. And it, it brings it to the front of their minds, and it, it scares them just almost, to do the drills. Almost like the, the duck and cover drills of the, uh, of the 1950s, right. you know, 40s and 50s, because the atomic bomb was going to get you. These kids before, before World War II never, never had a thought in the world of, you know, oh. their, yeah, of, of the bombs coming, but, but you look, at, you look at the statistics, and it even shows that the amount of anxiety that, that happened in that generation of kids was, was pretty severe. Because at any time, you may have to, you know, put a book over your head and, you know, hope, hope that, for the best. <laughs> hope for the best, yeah. Um, and, and I don't know... I don't know if any of you saw the um, the PSA that came out, the back to back to school PSA that came out um, by I, I believe it was, and the, the graphic will the graphic here will tell you the, whether I'm right or not. Again, not always right, um, but I believe it was by um, Sandy Ho- Sandy Hook survivors um, about these kids going back to school and what their back to school reality is really like. It was if, it was tongue in cheek, 
but it not was funny. it no it it was scary yeah, it was it was, it was scary i mean i i don't think that i easily tear up but i felt for those kids you know and it and it and it was it was tongue in cheek it was meant to be it, it was meant to grab your attention and it did and it did um yeah my brother my brother actually you know mike was the first one to post that and and he he even he even posted on it and you know he's he's a gruffer looking guy than I am. He's a man's um, man. Yeah, he is he is a man's man. Um but he even posted that he couldn't watch it a second time. Now of course I wanted to show him up, so of course I watched it a second time. Um <laughs> but then I watched it a third time and I, I really took in what I was watching and if you haven't seen if you haven't seen the back to school PSA, look, look it up. I'm sure it's I'm sure it's on YouTube. We'll you can even, add the link to yeah, the end we'll, of the yeah, video. Yeah, we'll even we'll even add the link um, <laughs> because it it's really powerful. If you want to understand what our kids are going through, this is this is it. And like Charlene said, it it, it is tongue in cheek, but wow, it, it's powerful. It, it is powerful. Um, but I digress. Um, but you can take you can take times like that, you know, stories of celebrities or stories of sports sports figures. If there's suicides there, talk about them. These are the times when things are at the forefront of their minds. And they're thinking about it, whether you're talking to them about it or not. They're they're listening to the stories, they're hearing the news, they're listening to their friends talk about mm-hmm. it. it. It doesn't disappear just because you don't talk about right. it. And again, like like I said last time, you know, there's there's no no sense in thinking that if you talk about it, it'll make them commit suicide. Again, hashtag talking about it won't make it happen. Um, because because <laughs> I love this line. If you talk to them about llamas, they're not going to turn into llamas. I promise. <laughs> so talking to them about suicide, opening the dialogue in whatever way that you can open it up, and it doesn't matter if they don't want to hear it. It doesn't matter. They'll, Put, they'll hear it. They, they'll they listen. will listen because as much as they may fight you back, they know that this is their this that this is their um, world, their the, reality, yeah, their reality. Yeah, exactly. Um, they know it's happening. So you talking about it isn't going to make it real for them. It, it's real. It's real for them. It's important to them. And I'm telling you, they don't know how to bring it up to you. Because they understand that your world is not their world. You know, the, you, we, we do as parents, do as I say, not as I do. You're not an adult yet. You know, children should be seen and not heard and things like that. And and we tell them these things and, and they understand that, they're not our equals. Not equals. And so what they Nor have to they do, be. right. And so what they have to do is they have to assume that that you don't understand their world either. So they're not going to necessarily come up and talk to you about it. If they're feeling blah, if they're feeling depressed, if they're feeling anxious, if they're starting to isolate, these are things that you can notice again as long as you know your kid. Um these are things that you can notice and you can address and you should address. You have to address. You can't ignore it. They need you to notice. Yeah. Absolutely 100% they need you to notice. Um, so how do you do that, do you think? You start conversations. Okay. Um, give them a chance to be heard. Give them the time to come around. If you walk up and say, hey, how you doing today? They're going to say, fine. They're going to say fine. You can't walk away. <laughs> you can't walk away. Okay, so how are you really doing? <laughs> I'm not asking just because I wanted to say it. I really want to know. Talk to me. What's going on? You've got to give them the chance to talk. You've got to give them the the, the time, atmosphere. the atmosphere, but also the time to think, okay, wait, all right, let me talk to her about this. Let me talk to him about this. They need time to to. Gather their thoughts. They're, they're not thinking of all the things right. that are bothering them. But when you sit and you give them the time, give them the time to pull it all together, too. Right. Um, be patient. Just listen. Just listen. Don't judge them. Don't criticize them. Don't give them advice. Don't interject with your own stories. Just listen. Give them the ear that they need. Mm-hmm. Go into it later. Talk about it at a different time. Um, but... 
just be the ear. I had a I had a client come in today, and you know he came in and said, "Well, yeah, you know, I'm really tired today, and you know, just kind of it's the end of the week, and just kind of I don't know that we'll talk about much." At the end of the session, we're walking out of the we're walking out of the office, and he says, "I am so sorry, I talk so much today," <laughs> and I looked at him and I said. It's kind of what your parents pay for. You're kind of supposed to talk in here. You want to give them. You want to give them that opportunity. And I promise you, as soon as you, as soon as you hit on on whatever topic it is that's that's coming up in their world, they're gonna seize on it. They're yeah. they're gonna they're gonna come around really really quick. What you can't do though is you cannot be their best friend. This is a place where they need you as a parent. They don't they don't need you to to really be a peer. Yeah. To try and placate them. Right. <clears throat> They need your advice. They need your, your guidance. They need to know that they can trust you to be the leader. Um, a lot of times, and and I think that you you may find this as well. A lot of times, I get the I get the clients who come in and they're like, I really just wish my parents would take away my phone at the end of the night, or I really wish they wouldn't let me have gone to that party, or I really wish they're looking to us to be. The regulators. Yeah. Perfect word. Yeah. Perfect word. They, they need limits. <clears throat> they don't want. And structure. And structure. And they're not going to admit it, and they may not realize that they need it, but they do. Sometimes it's a lot easier to blame us than it is to blame their own opinions and their own choices. Uh, dude, I can't go to that party. My mom would kill me. Is a lot better than, no, I really don't feel like going because there's going to be drugs there, and dude, I'm not all about that. That's not what they're going to say. But what they need to be able to say is, no, my mom would kill me. I'm not allowed. Yeah. You know, some of them, some of them will even make up stories. No, my mom drug tests me. I can't. They practice that in D.A.R.E., actually. In fifth grade D.A.R.E., they practice ways to to um, make up excuses and, and to get out of situations Perfect. that they know that they shouldn't be in. Um, if you're if you're fortunate enough, if your kids are fortunate enough to have worked with Officer Smiley, I was just about to say we <laughs> yeah. probably need to do a shout out to Officer Paul Smiley. Smiley. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, he, but he's been doing that for years with with fifth grade Dare, and just and the kids, every one of them mm. comes up to the front of the room at least twice during the program, and practices role plays, uh, making excuses for getting out of a situation that they don't feel comfortable in. Josh, my my, my youngest son, um, he's 20, he just turned 21. Um, he still remembers the stuff that Officer Smiley taught him in fifth grade. And so that was eons ago. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that you can say that will help. Um, you don't want to necessarily ask closed. Well, you don't want to ask closed-ended questions. Because they'll give you um, yes and no. Yeah, answers. you you get the one. Those are the ones where you get the one-word answers. How are you doing today? Fine. Fine. Okay. Did you have a good day? Yes. Something bothering you? No. no. <laughs> those those sorts of things. <laughs> but you can say, hey, tell me how you're feeling today. What's mm-hmm. what's going on in your world? Or like Charlene said earlier, you know, we, we used to call it when we were teaching people how to do it in therapy, rose and thorns. Give me give me one rose and give me one thorn. You know, one good thing, one bad thing that happened today. Yeah. And um. sometimes it, sometimes it's just, just stupid things like, um, I got to eat dinner. I got to go to PE. And believe it or not, even that starts a conversation. Mm-hmm. Like, okay. Great. What'd you do in PE so, day? So what was the best part of PE? I don't know. Uh, but they'll 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 start talking as soon as they know they've got an audience. Oh my gosh, you know yeah. that. You put them in front yeah. of their friends and watch right. watch how they start rattling. Well, them. watch them from afar because oh, yeah, if you're cause standing if you're too standing close, there, they won't talk. they're not going to talk. Yeah. Um, you want to also validate their feelings. You know, don't don't ever tell them that what they're feeling is wrong or they shouldn't feel that way or. Um, that they can't feel that way because there's no way that they could possibly understand that. You want to do that. Their their perceptions are their realities, and if they perceive that they're feeling X way, then that's how they feel, regardless of what we think, regardless of of what our assessment of their mental status is, or how we think they should be feeling. Right. Well, there's nothing wrong with you. Why do you feel sad? You have everything to be excited about. Yeah, we're going to. 
wherever Disney World tomorrow. Why? Why would you be anxious? <laughs> yeah, you know, don't don't invalidate their feelings. You absolutely want to make sure that they know that they can trust you with their feelings. Remember, this is you're you're opening the door to something that could potentially be a Pandora's box that saves their lives. This could be the conversation that makes them go from. I want to kill myself to, well, maybe there's something I can work f- towards and live for, and you know, maybe it's not all doom and gloom. Maybe somebody really does care. Maybe somebody really does care. You know? um, the, the easiest way, I, I get this a lot, um, don't ask why something happened. You know, because when you're asking why something happened or why you feel a certain way, you're you're kind of looking for an excuse. Because that immediately, to me, even as as a therapist as an adult, it makes me feel defensive. Right. You mean why? Because you know, I am. Because right. this is the way I feel. You you tell me you know that sort of thing, but. Tell me what happened to make you feel this way. That is a perfect sentence. And you know what? We're even going to put that graphic up right here so you can see it. Tell me what happened to make you feel this way. Tell me what got you to this place. Give me some information. I want to hear you. I want to learn what it's like to be a part of your world. Um, let me in. Yeah, let me in. There's there is a song um, that I have really come to love, um, and I keep hearing it on Sirius XM. That's the only reason I um, I even know it. I think um, it's a song by um, Lauren Daigle. Uh, it's it's called "You Say," and there's some really really fantastic lyrics. the the first The first line of the song um, goes. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Now, she wrote this song because as an artist, she was really feeling as though she was kind of a, a, maybe a one-hit wonder, kind of an imposter. Her, her story about this song is really great. If you can look it up on, on YouTube, it's, it's fantastic. Or even look it up on the web. It's in print, too. Um, but she was really kind of feeling as though... She didn't belong in all of the accolades, and the you know people were were complimenting her on something, and she just she wasn't feeling it. She didn't know where she was supposed to go next, or how people were were why people were feeling the way that they were feeling toward her. Um, but I I kind of got stuck on that first line. It, it literally the first time I heard it, um, I, I took a picture of of my radio because I. I couldn't write it down. I was in the car. So I just took a picture of the radio. Um, I was stopped, of course, at the time. Cause <laughs> of course. Because definitely would not you know, take a picture while I was driving down the road. Um, that would be unsafe, and we don't want you to be, <laughs> be unsafe. And against the law. And against the law. So no distracted driving here, if any officers are paying attention. Um, so, But I, I got really taken in by that first line. And I heard the first, the first verse of the song. And fortunately, on my radio, I can, I can you know, rewind it, which is great. Um, and so I played it again. And then I played it again. And then I played it again. Just this first line. And I was really taken in. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. And I was like, holy crap. This is what my kids are feeling. Yeah. I have these voices in my head. And... They're telling me I'm worthless. They're telling me that I'm no good. They're telling me everything that I fear about myself. And, wow, it must be true. The second line of the song, you know, says every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. We're, as parents, we're kind of complicit in this. If this if this goes on in our kids' heads, we're kind of complicit in this in that we're really kind of telling them, you know... I'm glad you got a B, but couldn't you have gotten an A if you just studied a little bit harder? You know, or you got a three on your on your milestones and You were well, so close to You were to so a close four. to a four. You, you made vars you made uh, J V. Yeah. Maybe next year you'll be varsity. Yeah. These are the these are the lines that are going through their head. They hear us. They hear us. It may look like our kids aren't paying attention, but I promise you, they, they, they may not hang on every word, but they're here, and they're hearing us, and they're in and the they're here and now, it. and, and they're, they're feeling it. it. Not just from us, but they're, they're feeling it from, from social media. They are, there used to be, when, when I was going to um, 
when I was going to school, my both my undergrad and my graduate program, and maybe you, you, you did some psychology classes mm-hmm. too. Um, and they talked about the invisible audience mm-hmm. as as a as a um, a developmental milestone in in emotional milestone in kids' lives. Developing a conscience, right? And and it's where it's where they kind of feel like the spotlight's on them, and everybody's looking at me. So the clothes have to be perfect, and my hair has to be phenomenal, and my makeup has to be great, and I can't be seen wearing that jacket, Mom. Oh my God, no! Everybody's gonna see it. Yeah. Everybody's. Gonna Did you get that from Goodwill? Will you take it back? Oh my God, no. Um. <laughs> Wow, that was scary. Um, but the thing is, is that that's how it used to be. We don't have that anymore. We don't have the imaginary audience because, here, let me take a selfie. Because now I'm going to put it out there and my imaginary audience is my 1,500 Instagram followers. Um, I, and all the people on Snap. I read something that said that went before cell phones, before social media, before all of that, if... Somebody at school didn't like our outfit or thought we were snobby or Mm -hmm. um, didn't like our new haircut. We might get the vibe, but there was no data. Right. And now they look and they say... Copious amounts of data. Well, I got my haircut and only 25 people commented. And she got her haircut last week and 116 people Mm -hmm. commented. So obviously she's better than me. They have quantitative data right in front of their faces that show that where they measure up with their peers. Mm -hmm. And, and you know what, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, KYS is a, is one of those acronyms that if you don't know it and you see it on your kid's social media, you, you really need to investigate. Do you know what that is? Kill yourself. Kill yourself. And it is one of the most abhorrent forms of cyberbullying because now I got 25 likes on my haircut and six people told me to kill myself. Wow. Six people told me to kill myself because I got my haircut and it doesn't look like hers. Wow. Or I was wearing last year's fashion or I tagged myself in a photo with the unpopular kid. Or because, did something stupid yeah, that caught on video. Or, yeah. Wow, that's horrible. It's wow. it's insane. And those three letters carry so much weight for our kids. I, I wish, and at the risk of sounding like a grumpy old man, I, I really wish we could go back to no social media. It, it's It's killing this generation. Literally killing this generation. Um, it's not, it, it, it's not shock value. It, it's real. It, it is absolutely real. Um, there's, I, I posted a story the other day, um, where, again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to blame the parents on this because I don't know the whole story, but this 11 year old boy was talking to a man they know it was a man, not not another kid. I was talking to a man on Snapchat. Um, obviously, this did not come to the radar of the parents or whatever for whatever reason. I don't know, and I'm not going to pretend to know. And I'm not again not shaming the parents, not blaming the parents because I don't know. But for whatever reason, it didn't rise to the level of concern. And this little boy snuck out of his house. 11 years old, mind you. This is in South Carolina. He snuck out of his house. He stole his brother's car. And for three hours and 200 miles, drove to meet this man that he met on Snapchat. Somewhere around the the three-hour, 200-mile mark, he lost the signal on his father's tablet. And therefore, the GPS signal, and therefore, he didn't know where else to go. So now this kid was lost. 200 miles from home, three hours from home, where nobody knew where he was. He's 11 years old. Any number of things could have gone wrong in the first five minutes, let alone the first three hours, um, where nobody knew where he was. 
this man knew he was coming to him because they were going to live together. Again, I don't know enough about the story to comment why it was happening. They don't know whether, as far as I know, they don't know whether or not the um, the man was was baiting him or was was even being nefarious. No idea. But in this social media world, we need to worry about this. The only reason that this boy didn't meet an un, an uncertain and untimely death was because when he got lost, he pulled into a, a parking lot of a, of a restaurant that was closed, and he pulled in next to a police officer. And the police officer said, how can I help you? He said, I'm lost. I don't know where I am. My GPS signal went up. The only reason that this kid was able to go back home was because his GPS signal went out. And he happened to pull into a restaurant next to a cop. Wow. Social media is the devil. <laughs> I, I'm not going to lie. And I realize the, the absolute irony of the fact that I'm telling you this <laughs> on a video that I'm posting to social media. <laughs> But, you know... Do as I say, not as I do. Hashtag what would Chuck say? <laughs> because you need to know this. But it is important. The difference is I'm a 45-year-old man. I'm not an 11-year-old boy. I'm not a 16-year-old girl. I can handle anything that, that people want to comment and throw at me. I can handle the trolls. I can handle everything... That is that is said to me in a derogatory, denigrative manner. I, I'm okay with that. Well, because you're mature and developed, and, right. and they're not. Which our kids are not. They're not. And please, please, please stop believing that they are. The number of parents I have that come in and say, "Yeah, I don't check their social media near as much as I I should." Why? Why? Let them be mad at you. I'd rather they be mad at you than dead. I'd rather they be mad at you than you not knowing what's going on in their lives. That somebody's bullying them or somebody's stalking them or, or that somebody's... They're in, a, they're in a situation that they, they can't... That they have no way to get out of. Right. Right. I, it's a scary world for them. And I'm meaning to put you on edge. I, I'm not... I don't want to sugarcoat this. Any of you who know me know that I'm the same person in therapy that I am outside of therapy. And I'm, I'm not sugarcoating this for you. Because there's no reason to. This is serious, serious stuff. This is the lives of our kids. Let me take you back to those to those statistics Charlie mentioned at the beginning. The second leading cause of death is suicide in 10 to 24-year-olds. And this isn't just, you know, I'm getting it out of USA Today. This is coming straight from the CDC. 4,600. 4,600 a year. 4,600 a year. Teenagers. This isn't even including the 10-year-olds, the 12-year-olds. This is 13 through 19. We need to wake up. We need to help our kids. This is problematic. They need to know that we're here. They need to know that we care. They need to know that they've got an out and an ally. Absolutely. The, you know... All of this digression in social media. I was talking about. I, I was talking about Lauren Daigle's um, song "Say You." Um, the the last line of her of her opening of her opening um, um, chorus stanza. stanza chorus whatever um, of her opening part of the song is "Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know." This is this is where you come in, parents. This is where you come in, grandma, grandpa, aunt and uncle, friends, whoever. Whoever's watching this, this is where you come in. Remind them who they are. Don't placate them. Don't over don't oversell it. Oh, you're the smartest, most sweetest, bestest person in all white No. You know what? You're a really smart kid. And I'm and I'm sad to see that you're getting F's because I know you can do better. How can I help you? What is it that I can do to assist you? What is it that you're feeling that's making your grades go from here to here in four weeks? 
there's something going on, and I'm not going to leave until until we talk about it, until you tell me what it is, and I'm not going to accept nothing right. for an answer. Now, on that same note, let me let me say that you can you can sometimes accept, and I don't know, because again, our kids don't always have they the don't. words. This is where this is where maybe you're saying, well, when was the last time you felt happy? That's a really good. That's a really good question. When do you feel this way? When do you feel this way? Is it on the weekends, just before you go back to school? Is it when you come back from dad's house, soccer practice, your friends' houses? You know, Give talk them to the your voice. kids. Yeah, you're you're the adults. Lead the discussion. And if you don't know how, there are so many resources online. So many resources online. Heck, rewatch this video. We've given you about forty of them. Sit down with your sit down with your kids. It's it really is. And again, you know, I, I say it over and over and over again. This is this is my crusade. Mm. I am tired of our kids killing themselves. I am tired of our kids getting to the point where they feel like suicide is even an option because it's not. Right. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. And it's never the only option or the best option. No. But in their limited experience, this is where I'm at, and there is no other. There is no other way. Well, because everything seems so final to them. Everything. And bleak. It seems like there's no end to these things. Even though we know they're temporary. Even though we know as adults, it, it'll be over in a week. It'll be over in a couple of days. It'll all blow over. Um, they don't see that. No. They don't know that. They don't trust. That things are temporary. It, they, they're living in the moment, and they don't know that the moment's going to change. They don't know that they'll feel better because they felt this way, and it's not gotten better. It's not gotten any better. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's nothing that I can do. It's it's just kind of mm. yeah. That's the way it is. It's me. So they need you to help them. And don't accept don't, don't accept that, those answers. Talk to them. Engage them. Be the parent that they need you to be, not the one that you want to be. It's it's important. Um, let me let me go back a little bit and talk about bullying for a minute. Um, this is going to be our last our last video specifically about suicide prevention, although. For this month, I mean, um, as September winds to a close and October comes up, we're going to make the transition in in our focus from suicide prevention to bullying prevention. Um, the videos that come after this are going to be more involved in how bullying leads to things like depression, leads to things like anxiety, leads to things like suicide. Um, You'll notice I'm wearing my, my University of Tennessee shirt. I love shirt. that shirt. I love um, that shirt. <laughs> for those of you who don't know the story, it was it was college shirt day at a at an elementary school in Florida. Um, and a fourth grader. He loves the University of Tennessee, but he didn't have a UT t-shirt. Uh, and so he wore an orange t-shirt, and he took a piece of, of um, notebook, notebook paper. paper, and he made this design. This is you of T, it says University here, of Tennessee, and he wore it, and he was bullied he was by his classmates. He was probably so proud of it, too. He That's what was. makes me so sad, is he was probably, he probably so proud was. of it. Um, and I don't know exactly how, but the story kind of went viral. And the University of Tennessee, go Vols, um, was really taken with this kid's story. Instantly. Instantly. Um, they shipped him so much school paraphernalia that he will never <laughs> ever have to miss a college shirt day again. <laughs> and then they then they decided to do even one better. And they created his his T shirt. Um, this is 
for all of you who make fun of me when you come in the office and you see my you see my orange and white uh glasses in my office and you make fun of me for being a Tennessee fan. I know, I know, I get it. All of you Georgia this fans, makes it but worthy, you know though. what? This makes it worthy. This right here makes me so proud to be a Tennessee fan. Go Vols. Um, because this just went above and beyond. Yeah. This kid was bullied because he just wanted to fit in. Yeah. And that bugs me. That bugs me a lot. There's no, there's no need for it. There's no, there's no reason. There's no for outcome. It. No, nothing comes out of no. it. Fortunately, something good did come out of this. The kid, the the boy who is who is bullied, who made the T-shirt, um, given that he meets all of the other admission criteria, was given a full ride scholarship four years to the University of Tennessee. Class of <laughs> a long time from now. <clears throat> um, what is your what's your class? Um, I think fourth graders now are twenty twenty six from high school. So. Okay, so he'll be he'll be class of twenty thirty uh, for for UT, um, and they took a bunch of the proceeds from the sale of the shirt. And let me tell you something: when I say this went viral, the University of Tennessee. Um, School web page that that sells the that sells the fan the fan merchandise crashed. They sold mm-hmm. sixty thousand pre order t shirts their first day, awesome. and they continued to sell more. I hope um, this boy knows the whole story. I hope he knows. That. I think he does. That's, that's yeah, cool. I think he does. Really and cool. then they're also giving they're also giving a portion of the proceeds of the sale of the shirt to um, to stomp out bullying. Um, which it's it really does my heart good to know that we're starting to take bullying very seriously. Yeah. This is something that we we can't allow in our schools, we can't allow in our homes, and really, if we see it in our kids, we, we can't allow it in them. We, we deserve to give them better lives than that, make them better people than that, you know. We, I read something the other day. It was a, it was a meme. Um, if you don't know what memes are, get your kids to tell you. They'll, they'll show you. Um, some of them are pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> but it was a meme that said something along the lines of, "We're not born with, ha- we're, we're not born with hate. It's something that we learn to do." Oh, absolutely. And that, that really kind of hit home for me because. Where are we learning it? Yeah. And you know what? I'm going to leave it there because, friends, that's exactly what Chuck would say. Have a great day. <laughs>